Hi, everyone. Do we have some people here? Welcome. Looks like we just had a few attendees come through. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is uh, Frederick Jenka. I'm the executive director of the Carolyn Glass of Bailey Foundation. I'm very pleased to be joined today with um, the fantastic and always inspiring Cole M. James. Cole is um, had, had a bit of an extended residency. <laughs> She's still our, um, our current artist um, at the Ojai Institute at our space in Ojai um, and was really uh, our first, um, how do you say it, uh, guinea pig for lack of better words on our new uh, satellite website called the Institute.org. So if you do have a chance at some point, I'll put it in the chat, but um, there's some great installation shots of her, of her um, exhibition at our space, as well as some individual works. Um, so thank you all. Again, I'm seeing some more people come in. And um, so, yes, yeah, so I would encourage you to go check out more about her um, exhibition and her practice on um, the Institute.org. Uh, we are also in the midst of our um, Give to Artists campaign this month. And so, um, you know, should you feel able, um, you know, I, we would be grateful for a donation in any amount. Um, we are also um, a percentage of a new book um, about the, um, our namesake, foundation namesake, Carolyn, written by her sister, um, Lila. Um, it's called The Situation, A Radical Journey Through Sisterhood. A uh, percentage of sales are also going to support our, um, our Gift to Artists campaign and our art prize this year. So um, I just share in that information. Um, I am going to, um, once again, I see a few more people coming in. Hi, I'm Frederick Jenka. I'm the executive director of the Caroline Glass of Bailey Foundation. I have Cole M. James here. And, um, you know, Cole, I, I think I'm just going to pass it on to you and you can kind of give us an overview and then let's just jump in. So yes, thank you so much for having me. I am really grateful for the foundation for being such a great supporter of me throughout this entire residency. Um, I, I'm so honored to be here and I'm really excited to share my travels with you. So today we're going to take a trip to Ghana. Um, I was in Ghana 2019, July and August for about a month. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and jump in and like Freddie, I don't know if you already said it, um, but we'll have questions at the end. So feel free to put them in the chat. That would be great. Yeah, sorry, I forgot some of the housekeeping. <laughs> no worries, we're a team. So we have, we have the chat function is open if you wanna say hi to either of us. We also have the Q&A function and I'll be monitoring that. And probably in the last five, 10 minutes of the, um, of the presentation, we'll get into questions. We're shooting for about a 30 minute um, event today. And, um, and yeah, thank you so much for being a part of this and I'm passing it off to Cole now. Yeah, so um, the preparation for going to Ghana, um, really kind of involved me doing some research about where I was going. And since I was going to be traveling to both metropolitan areas and very rural areas, I kind of packed a really hefty, hearty uh, pack, travel pack, just to have everything I need. But what was really important is that this trip was not just about going to another space, another country, but it really was about me finding more information, firsthand documents, firsthand information about the journey between the United States and Africa. So I chose to read um, Homegoing by Yag Gayasi, and the book traces a bloodline from Ghana to the United States and back through two sisters who actually never have met However, it talks about their trajectories in these two spaces simultaneously over time. So if you're planning on taking a trip to Ghana, I would definitely pick that up, spend some time reading it. It's also on audiobook. Um, and there's a few must-haves in your travel pack, which for me is a, a something called Picardin, which is um, for mosquitoes, as well as make sure you get your shots make sure that you take your meds with you. 
um, and take them pretty regularly as the doctors have prescribed. Um, I also have in this pack some dispose, some reusable bags, reusable straws, reusable utensils. It's a really good practice that when you do travel abroad and you travel to areas that are have a high tourist population, it's a good idea to carry things that you don't have to throw away so you're not adding into that space. And since I was also going to be traveling to very rural um, areas, I also definitely did not want to leave trash anywhere near there was wildlife. So I carried a lot of things like that with me. Now, here is a map of where we're gonna be going today. And again, I was there for a month. I'm trying to condense all of the, the good juicy bits into one part, um, but there's always more to discover. So we arrive in Accra. We're gonna to travel to Adafo, Kumasi, Kakum National Forest, Cape Coast, Takaradi, and Aquida. So those are the places we're gonna go mostly along the coast. The most inland place we're gonna go is Kumasi. So um, why going at this moment was really important. So 2019 is the year of the return in Ghana. And what that signifies is a uh, return of the golden thing I really encourage you to invest some time in, in learning about, but it also marked 400 years since the transatlantic slave trade. So there was a big push by the Ghanaian government to welcome back any descendants um, from the continent. And so it was really important to go there. And this particular image was actually part of an installation that was there in Ghana. And something that I found really interesting, and I'll touch back on it, was I never expected people in Africa to think about the relationship between African Americans and Africans. Um, and that, that I was on their minds as much as they were on my minds, I think brought me a lot of comfort when I was there. So the first place we're gonna visit is Accra. Now, a few things about Accra. It is a major metropolitan area. There is about 2.2 million plus people that live in Accra. Um, and the word Accra is an Akan derivative that um, means ants. And I say that and you're like, oh, ants. But if you've ever experienced uh, a very specific ant that lives in Ghana, which is the soldier ant, the soldier ant is considered the king of the bush. And, and these ants can actually take down an elephant. So it's not such a small thought to think about ants. And I think um, within Ghana, there's so much richness as well. There are, um, the language of Khan actually has several different dialects, which includes the Fonti, the Asante, the Bono, um, and then the modern derivative is called Twi. And so learning Twi was really fun, um, going and, and, and learning a language and having people so willing to teach me uh, was really fantastic. Uh, there are also, there's a, a president just like, never mind, there's a president that exists, <laughs> similar to the structure of, of democracy here, um, but there are also chiefs. And the position of the chief is that the, the politicians ask the chiefs for guidance because the chiefs are closer to the people. So that's the structure. So the first thing you do when you go to Accra is you get a coconut. So coconuts are sold on the streets everywhere. They're an amazing source of hydration um, as well as a little bit of protein. So how I recommend doing it is I have my, my straw that I brought with me in my pack. So bring your straw with you. First thing, get off the plane decompress and go have a coconut. Um, what they do is they cut them open for you fresh there and you stand there next to the cart, drink the coconut juice, and then you ask them to open it up for you so you can actually scoop out the meat. Um, that's the only way to eat a coconut there. Uh, next, uh, while you're in Accra, there's lots, since it's a tourist area, there's lots to offer. Uh, I recommend the Abajo Culture and Art Cafe. So there's lots of really awesome things that happen at Abajo. They're 
our delicious foods. They'll come and perform for you. Now I want you to understand the culture in the tourist space is that if people come and perform for you or they serve food, yes, it is customary to tip. So not only is it you have to tip, what you also want to avoid doing is sending your food back. So if something's wrong with your food, sometimes the person that ordered it actually has to pay for it, which is actually not such a strange practice. It happens in smaller cafes and things like that. Um, waiters and waitresses here in the United States, they usually pay for your drink and then they come to you and then they collect the money. And that's kind of a structure that still exists there. So definitely a Bajo Cafe. Um, I chose to get a pineapple juice this time, which was also delicious. And of course you always have coconuts. Any opportunity you can to get the fresh coconuts, get the fresh coconuts. Um, Ghana itself, where I visited, was along the coast. So you're going to see a lot of fish today, a lot of fish. Not too far from Abajo, um, you can see the memorial to the first president of Ghana. And he is entombed there with his wife. And so this particular structure was created for the first prime minister um, of Ghana. And he was the one that led Ghana into independence from actually the entire Gold Coast into independence away from Britain in 1957. So Ghana was one of the last to be colonized because it was super hard to defend. And then the first to actually gain independence after that time. Um, and so I definitely encourage you. And there are this, these grounds are absolutely lovely. There's peacocks roaming around and they're beautiful sculptures um, of, of action and activation. And then when you go inside this area, the tombs are on the inside. Um, one side's for, for him and the other side is for his, his wife. So I highly recommend spending some time in that particular space. When you get there, so I don't know how you travel, but when I travel, I like to eat. I like to eat, period. I love food, and I feel like a really great way to get in touch with a different culture or a culture that's not your own is to understand and learn the food. Um, but I found it hard to go find the food. What I did find was lots of um, European and American adaptations of the food, which was really fun. Um, so Burger and Relish was one, The Republic, which we'll visit again. And also, so Ghanaian food, there's a lot of stews, there's a lot of hot food. So one thing that I found myself craving was salads. And there's not a lot of places to go get salads there, um, although the produce is beautiful. Um, I recommend the Sunshine Bar. Uh, it has absolutely delicious salads. Um, and it's pretty much open during the day and you could walk right in, very friendly staff and delicious. So Ghana also has a really beautiful nightlife and opportunities to really like enjoy live music and have really good wine. So um, I've discovered that I am now a huge fan of African wines. Um, they're just on a whole nother level. Uh, so on the very far side, where it says the Gekko Ridge Cabernet, there's a hotel there called the Kapensky that we'll also visit, uh, where you can get lots of these really beautiful wines and delicious traditional and, uh, you can actually get traditional Lebanese and Chinese food in this space. So there's a large population of Lebanese and Chinese that have migrated to Ghana for industry. So, there's actually a really diverse group of people and experiences you can have. So this is the Kapinski Hotel. I recommend staying at least one night there. Um, it's beautiful and you never know who you would meet there. So a lot of dignitaries and celebrities from all over the world stay there. So even just sitting in the lobby, you just never know who you'll run into um, in that space. Um, they have lovely rooms um, and delicious foods uh, that you can explore. Um, another thing you should do when you're in Accra is to purchase fabric. So there are two structures in which you can do this. Um, I recommend doing both. There's a place called Wooden, and Wooden is the traditional um, wax print space. However, it's European made, European funded. Um, and doesn't necessarily support the local economy. If, however, the products are very, 
they're well made. But if you go to the markets, you actually get to support. Uh, there's a lot of women owned businesses in Ghana that sell not exactly the, the wooden grade wax print because these vendors are actually having to buy it out of their pocket and then sell it. So you can go to the market and purchase lots of different types of fabric. And then what you do with that fabric is you have clothes made. So have your clothes made while you're there. There's seamstresses ever and tailors everywhere. And I highly recommend that you get to pick and it's super easy. You show them a picture of what you want. They take your measurements. You come back a little bit later. And when I say a little bit later, I want you to really understand that there's a difference in the way time is expressed and experienced there. Uh, there is no rush. So what I ended up doing was when I first arrived, I gave my measurements and my fabric. And then at the end of my trip, I picked up my clothes. So I had several items made and I absolutely adore all of them. Okay, also while um, in Accra, you can take a little ride out to the Jamestown area. This is a fisher town. There's lots of beautiful smoked fish everywhere in this space and a lot of familiar foods. So I found things like okra and black eyed peas all over this space, which for African Americans in the States, those are pretty deep staples within our diet. And so to see those as, as part of the everyday in Ghana and then learning the story that seeds for things like yams, sweet potatoes, okra, that these were actually seeds that were stuffed and kept sometimes in, in the mouth of, of people or in certain areas of their clothes, they would save these seeds and then they brought them with them through the middle passage um, as a way of trying to keep hold of some part of their roots. So the next place we're gonna go is Adafo. And when I went to Adafo, it was to actually spend time with an artist by the name of Kwame um, Koto Bamfo. And so being in Ghana, one of the incentives for me going is to really connect to artists there, working on similar themes about connectivity, about ancestral history, about remembering, about keeping and saving um, our shared humanity in the space. And while I was there, we went to his very vast, so when I say studio, it's just vast earth everywhere with these outdoor areas to work that was beautiful. And so this is Kwame's kiln. And what Kwame is actually working on is um, the Njinjim uh, installation. And this installation um, that word in itself, nchinchin, means life twists and turns, and it's not always easy. And so this installation is made up of um, heads, and it's part of the Akan funeral practice of doing portraits of the dead. And it's actually to commemorate those lost over time through slavery. And there are hundreds of these. There's so many. He models, and he hand carves every single one of them. So it's not mass produced, it's actually a hand carved and each one has a story behind it. And so he'll um, create those. And if you can't get to Ghana and check out his work, you can actually see his work at the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. So this particular sculpture that you see there was created by Kwame. So even that connection, learning more about African artists thinking about the connective tie we have to this institution that separated peoples and displaced them throughout the world, I think was probably something that I will always take with me. Um, also in Ghana, while there, I visited the slave castles and I, I didn't know how to approach them. I think reading the book Homegoing helped me understand that institution a little bit more. But what I found really interesting was the Ghanaian's refusal to erase that information. That this will stand as a monument to remember. Um, and the plaques that are there, like this one here, that say, may humanity never again perpetuate such injustice against humanity. And it wasn't about a person, it wasn't about a nation, it wasn't about a people, but it's about humanity. Um, and there were certain areas 
of the space where I could understand and I could feel myself coming to terms and then, but also validating my need to continue to do this work. And the door in the center, when it was first created, it would say the door of no return. But the philosophy in these spaces is that this is a door of return. So the whole point of the year of the return is to welcome back all of the descendants that have been displaced through Europe, through South America, to the Caribbean, to all of these places to come back. Um, and when I was in Cape Coast, there was actually a procession where there was over about, there was about 1200 people of African descent from other countries where in Cape Coast, they shut the lights down in the entire town. We walked through the city with candles all the way up until this door to pay homage to our ancestors, to let them know we're thinking of them, to let them know that we have returned. We are not lost. Your line is still strong. And I think leaving the spaces helped me understand why I need to keep up the fight and why it's so important that my voice is always heard and why it just kind of made me feel like, okay, so my ancestors survived being captured. They survived being in the slave castle. They survived the middle passage. And then they came to the United States and they, they survived every single oppressive tactic to make it so that I would be here today. And I think with that comes a lot of power and with that comes a lot of reassurance of the truth of my own existence. So with that, I'd like to introduce us to a new word and the new word is Akwaba. Akwaba means welcome. So we're now gonna still be a little bit in the Cape Coast, but also explore Kumasi. So this is the palace of the chief. You can't really take pictures inside, so I have no pictures of the inside. I really wanted to like respect and honor that space. Um, but what's outside is this, this booming fishing town. Um, no commercial fishing here. What is happening there is that the boats that you see belong to people who make their living with fishing. And then if you look out on the horizon, you start to see some commercial fishing boats that are kind of hurting um, the local economy. Um, which also understands that it exists part of a grander scheme. So I found this map at one of the, the places where I stayed, um, which kind of echoed this idea that this Ghanaian belief that, you know, we're not here alone, you're not isolated, but actually you're part of a larger community that all adds to what it is that we understand it means to be um, together. And I love the sentiments of peace. So this is the peace bell, the only part of the castle uh, that you can actually take uh, a picture of. What's beautiful about the inside of this space is that on the inside, it's the living quarters. Obviously it doesn't live there anymore, but so what's there is all of these gifts from all over the world, from other countries, um, and then all kinds of traditional um, where so this is bonfire and bonfire is where they create kente for consumption so not necessarily the royal kente but the kente for like everyday people people like me people um, that just want kente made so um, there are predominantly male weavers and the relationship between work and music was really exemplified here because as they're weaving, it's making a musical sound and they, they're weaving in tandem with each other. So it was a beautiful thing to watch and listen to. Um, and each person who's weaving has their own stall. So, and they have a little, everybody has a different style of kente that they make. Um, and so you can order, you can ask them to make something for you or you can buy from their stalls. Um, another really important part of when I travel um, is to learn about the culture without doing any harm. Um, so not only can I do I, how do I learn about this culture without doing harm, but how do I actually support the existence of this culture? So uh, what I did was participate in several cultural workshops by a fair trade group called Global Mamas. So these are all local women who have a skill and they teach that skill to other people. So in this one, um, this is one where I learned how to do um, batik. 
uh, which was super fun. And I got to make my own. There was a dance class that I took that they decided they're like, you need to dress up. I was like, I don't have to dress up. They're like, no, we will dress you then. I was like, no, I'm not going to dress up. They're like, no, no, we're going to dress you. And I was like, okay. And so this is what they chose for me. And there was also a cooking workshop, which I think by far, and when you take a workshop with someone who's a mom, it's not just the workshop. You're learning how to ask for things, how to be polite. You're learning how to say thank you, how to say please. Like it, it was an amazing experience that I, 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 I can't even describe it. But, and it's super reasonable to take these classes. And they also have a shop with food that people have grown and, and also more fabric. Um, taking a little trip while you're in Kamasi to um, Kakum National Forest. So uh, Kakum National Forest is a beautiful national park. And one of the beautiful things about this space is that instead of walking through the jungle, disturbing everything that's around, you actually take a canopy walk. So all of the living creatures below the canopy can just do what they do every single day. They don't have to stop and say, oh my gosh, it's Saturday, here these people come, move everything out. It's like, they just get to be the elephants and the monkeys and the millipedes and centipedes and all of the wildlife. And you just kind of observe them from really, really high above on rope bridges um, with these built out platforms on some of the larger trees. And it was breathtaking. You can also camp overnight, which I think I'm gonna look into the next time I go is like you can camp again up high um, in one of the, the canopy tents. And I, I, I think I, I really would like to try that because it was a beautiful forest. Um, and then there's Seda Buddha House. So the end of my trip, was um, at a residency at a place called the Seda Buddha House, which is um, part of a residency hosted by Todd Gray. And it is a house that opens up into the ocean in a very rural area. So I took uh, about an hour plane ride to Takarati and then a two hour drive on unpaved roads to Seda Buddha House. But every minute of it was worth it. Um, you will learn a lot about the, the landscape because of that specific drive. There's a fantastic guide there by the name of Yankee who kind of helps you, takes you on hikes and all of those things. And Seda Buddha House is, has a beautiful garden that is fully sustainable and has everything that you need there. Um, plantains, ground nuts, tomatoes, garlic, ginger, yams, and then there's fish right there um, because the ocean is there. So I have a little video. Of Yankee telling me how to enjoy ground nuts. Um, there's lushness and the most gorgeous, beautiful morning hikes along the beach there without people. So going from the really metropolitan area and then moving into this beautiful coastal space was really, really lovely. Um, and then there's this place called the Special Beach or Secret Beach. And what was lovely about that space is that you can see the seashells becoming sand. So they're in various stages of change and it's all happening right there in front of you. Um, one of my favorite ecological spaces are estuaries. So estuaries are when rivers meet oceans. Um, the mix of salt water and fresh water I find like really fascinating and the flora and fauna that grows in that space is super diverse. Even the makeup of the stones in that space are really beautiful. Um, and at this particular one, there's a bamboo forest uh, that in order to hike through, you actually have to ask permission from the chief of the village that sits at the, the foot of this particular hike. It's a very formal space, um, but even out there in the very rural spaces, the openness to help me understand my relationship to this earth and this land was cherished and, and considered valid. And I thought that was really beautiful. And there's the best way to finish a day 
is to definitely with some fufu. So fufu is, it's like, it's, it's the staple that comes along with your fish and plantains. Um, it's a very laborious process. The yams are boiled and then they're pounded until the starch forms a dough and you eat it with your fingers um, and you have it with fish. Now, this fisherman was really generous. We helped him pull his boat in and because we helped him pull the boat in, he gave us a fish from his day's catch. And I think that really kind of sums up what I understood Ghana to mean. Um, community, work, togetherness, sharing, um, and a cultural responsibility of all of us to take care of the earth and also to take care of each other. So yeah, that's what I have. And I say, Medasa mo e, ah, meda mo ase. That means thank you, plural. Thank All you. All right, so questions. Thank you so much. That was really um, such a treat. And um, you did such a great um, job on keeping us on time, too. <laughs> um, if anybody has, oh, I see some clapping hands in our chat. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to, to drop them in um, mm -hmm. the chat or the Q&A, and I'll um, have a look at them. Um, I think, uh, you know, Cole, I wonder, you know, with such a special experience, um, how do you how do you imagine a return trip? I know that there were certain your circumstances that came together to make this possible for you, but what does that look like for you? I think a second trip involves, there's an area in Ghana called the Volta region. Um, and in the Volta region, what's preserved there is more spiritual practices. And so a return trip to me, Definitely looks like visiting Seda Buddha, um, obviously flying into Accra, but, but exploring the Volta region, exploring some of the places where um, there are a lot of villages still intact. Uh, so a second, that's what a second visit looks like, is being able to um, tap into that there. One of the artists that I met is doing research about um, abstraction and uh, religious symbolism that exists within those spaces because a lot of it hasn't been documented in the western way of documenting and researching and so to think about symbols outside of that space i'm really interested in in that conversation that sounds exciting i want to go too uh, so we have a question or a half comment half question here cole your talk was so amazing and inspiring are you able to share your talk with others especially young students um, well, I think, you know, uh, to answer that first, uh, we, we are, um, we tried Instagram Live, for, or not Instagram Live, sorry, Facebook Live for the first time. So this is now streaming on Facebook, um, on the Carolyn Glass of Bailey Foundation page. And then we're also recording, so um, we'll be able to share it ourselves. But then Cole, I'm sure you, you teach, you have, um, of, and maybe you've shared a little bit of this before with people, so tell us. Yeah, I shared a little bit of this uh, conversation and it entered um, some community led work that I did at um, Angels Gate in Los Angeles. I have a show that, I mean, technically it's still up, um, <laughs> but it was, um, and it was about me sharing um, the journey into this. So when I, when I approached this work, it was like, I'm just gonna go and open up my threshold for understanding so that I can just take it all in. Um, assuming I was going to come to a space where I knew nothing, um, I didn't want my assumptions to come in. So I think anytime I have an opportunity to share the, the fact that it's okay to kind of investigate things you don't know, you don't have to know or be good at something in order to study it. So I'm always excited to share this. And then like Freddie said, it could, it's, it's recorded. I'm on Facebook Live. Technically, I think this is the first time I've ever been on Facebook Live ever in the history of me. Um, I love it. Um, yeah, oh, it's it. open. Oh, sorry. Um, Cole, sorry. One more question. Um, did you study anthropology in school or theology? Oh, whoever asked that question is so bright. Uh, and I'm glad that that's coming through. Uh, I actually got a chance to study 
my undergrad art career at a liberal arts college. And so because I studied at that liberal arts college, I was exposed to a lot of different disciplines. And when I came to understand art, I understood it best through anthropology, through art history, through psychology. And I actually did study, um, I'm a, I'm a, I would love talking about religions. Uh, I have several religious texts from different spaces because I'm, I'm fascinated, I think, more with how we think about how we exist and the philosophies and theories around why we think we're here, you know, um, what we're supposed to be doing and, and how that develops as an ideology, how that develops as a culture building space. So I'm super excited that you picked on that. I love talking about anthropology. I love talking about just why are we here? What are all the things that people say about why we are here and what we're supposed to do? And how many different ways are people doing that in the world? Thank you, Cole. Okay, one final question here, everyone. Um, Ghana looks like an amazing land of plenty. As an American citizen, do you feel like you'd ever move to Ghana for quality of life reasons? Yes. So um, one of the first things, one of the first reasons that I even thought about wanting to go to Ghana was because there's an international law called the right of return. And the right of return says that anyone can go back to their home country or their country of origin. But that's always been something, well, I wasn't born in Ghana, I wasn't born in Africa, but I know my ancestors are from there. And so to have Ghana then say, look, you can return at any point, at any time, and we will welcome you. I've been thinking about it. Um, it's really hard because what's taking place in Ghana is a lot of colonialism. So there are other countries colonizing, America included, resources, land, um, food, and there aren't the same regulations that there are in, in um, more developed countries. Uh, you know, there are companies that have been banned from the United States that have large manufacturing plants in Ghana. I remember like driving on the street and being like, uh, like on that two hour drive to Takarati and since it's so rural, seeing these companies that I'm like, oh my gosh, like that company should not be anywhere near where there is life, period. Um, and that being really surprising. So if I were to move, I would have to figure out a way to be as little or low impact on that current economy and, and what do I have to offer um, that particular space uh, and really think deeply about it. But Absolutely. I, I am constantly trying to figure out how can I live there for six months out of the year and maybe live where my family is for six months out of the year. So I'm, I'm, it's a really beautiful space. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Cole. And thank you, everyone, all our participants. It's really been wonderful to see all your names pop up. And thanks for the questions and comments. Oh, wait, one one quick question. Um, when you were in Ghana, were people curious about Los Angeles? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> they, were, they were not very curious about Los Angeles. They already knew what it was, and I will have to be able to say, like, yeah, and they were right, like, 100% of the time. Um, I think... What was really interesting was how fascinated they were with American culture. Um, they pretty much knew things I, I would not have even, they're like, oh, I didn't know that. And they're like, yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, it really wasn't, which was actually refreshing. They were more interested in sharing Ghana with me. And I would not have wanted it any other way, I think. 
Awesome. Well, thank you again. I wanted to also share with everybody that um, our next one tomorrow, same time, we're going to be going to Oaxaca with an amazing Zapotec textile um, artist, Porfirio Gutierrez. So um, links are on our website. Again, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Cole. This has been incredibly special. We look forward to sharing this with, with everyone who wasn't able to attend tonight. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you. Cheers. Bye. Yeah.